good day students so in this part of the lecture in continuation with the hearts or the evolution of the heart <clears throat> now we are going to discuss the heart in the case of the amphibians now previously we had discussed about uh, the hearts in the fishes and there we have seen that uh, the fishes they have got two chambered heart we have got a single auricle and a single ventricle with the two accessory chambers so one can be the sinus venosus and one is the conus arteriosus now if uh, we take some modifications in the fishes we had seen that in the case of dipnonians we have got a three chambered heart so there we talked about uh, that how the three chambered heart was formed in that particular case because those fishes were having lung uh, along with the gills so the course of circulation that was changed in the dipnonians and we have a three chambered heart then so in that case we had two auricles and a single ventricle now in that lecture we had also talked about the partial septum so there was a partial septum which was present in between the two atria there was a partial septum in the ventricle also there was a partial septum in the conus arteriosus also so that was for the complete separation of the two streams of the blood so in that particular lecture we had talked about the origin or the starting point of the double kind of circulation in case of fishes so that started with the dipnonians now then we talked about the coronary circulation that was from the uh, efferent branchials which were having the freshest blood in the body of the fishes from those uh, uh, arterioles fresh blood was taken into the hypobranchial arteries then they were forming the coronary arteries so that was the course of the coronary circulation in the case of fishes so students now <clears throat> we are talking about the amphibians now if i talk about a frog suppose so what type of heart is present in these amphibians this is very comparable a heart to the lung fishes so i'll be giving you some of the concepts that how they have got a three chambered heart and what is the function of uh, all the chambers in uh, amphibians so before starting this particular thing i must give you some concept that uh, the amphibians <coughs> they are living both in the water and on the land so that means they should have some mechanism which is uh, uh, both pertaining to the water medium they can take oxygen from the water also and they are also taking oxygen from the air so these amphibians they have developed a particular kind of mechanism in which they can uh, both ways transfer the oxygen from a liquid medium and a airy medium so they can take oxygen from the air directly so this is a good mechanism and they have developed a, a particular respiratory system for uh, taking up the oxygen so they have developed lungs they have the trachea they have tracheoles the very similar system that we have uh, for respiration so they have developed that kind of respiratory system <clears throat> now if we talk about the uh, you can say the take up of oxygen from the water so there is a very specific mechanism which is found in amphibians and that is through the moist skin through the general body surface of the mouth lining so this is a very important you can say respiratory seat in case of amphibians that their mouth lining or we can say the buccopharyngeal cavity lining it is capable to take up the oxygen from the water so this mechanism has uh, given the amphibians a very high efficiency to live both in the waters and in the air so students with these uh, words i would like to start with the 
heart in the case of amphibians. So let us start with it. Now, first of all, uh, if I take a particular heart of the frog, now here you can see this is a typical dissected frog with its heart open. So you can very well see the presence of, uh, this is the left auricle, this is the right auricle, this is the ventricle. So that's how we have a three-chambered heart in the case of frogs or in the case of amphibians. Now here you can very well see that the ventricle is quite triangular in shape. So it has got a known, very well known tip at the apex of the heart. So it is tipped at the apex. So this is a peculiar feature of the amphibian heart. So if you see there is a particular structure which is called as the truncus arteriosus. So as we have the conus arteriosus in the case of uh, fishes. So here it is written as the truncus arteriosus. Now, as the name suggests, the truncus, truncus refers to a trunk. It is, a, you can say, much modified structure as compared to the conus. But the main function of conus and truncus, they are similar. So whenever the blood, it is leaving the ventricle through this truncus arteriosus, the function of the truncus is to provide the pressure needed with which the blood can reach the aortic arches. Now these are the aorta or these are the arteries into which the blood is flowing through the heart. So they are called as the aortic arches. So in the coming sections we will be taking up after this evolution of heart, we will be taking the evolution of the aortic arches also. So that is a separate question. So how these arches they develop and how they are taking blood out of the heart, this will be our next topic in the evolution of the aortic arches. So here you can very well see, this is the lung which is present in the amphibians. So uh, this is the left lung, we have a right lung over here. So these are the lungs or these are the seat of oxygenation which are typically present in the amphibians along with some kind of buccopharyngeal respiration also. So, <clears throat> if I go further, this particular diagram can give you the double kind of circulatory mechanism in case of the amphibians. So, here you can very well see, we have got two auricles and a single ventricle, but the blood is coming from both the sides into a common ventricle. So here everybody thinks, everybody can think of the mixing of the blood. But the God is great and uh, it has given the frogs the capability of keeping the two streams separate with some other mechanisms. So I'll be taking those mechanisms further in the coming slides. So in the case of amphibians, we have got a typical three-chambered heart again, as we had in the dipnonian fishes. But the simple fishes, the elasmobranchs, they have got the two-chambered heart. Now students, if we go further, this is a typical frog's heart on both the dorsal side. It is the dorsal side of the heart. It is the ventral side of the heart. <coughs> And if you get this question in your examination, suppose you get a question on give the evolution of the heart, then you have to only concentrate on the diagrams of the heart which are showing the chambers. You are not going to make the dorsal and the ventral sides of the heart. You are not going to make the, you can say, uh, the outer structures of the heart. No, you have to give the internal structures. So these are the diagrams that you have to go for the, uh, in this particular question. Now students, <clears throat> this is the truncus arteriosus that we have seen in the previous uh, picture. And uh, this is exerting the pressure. And this is the typical heart of the 
amphibians. So here you can have, the, this is the right auricle, you have the left auricle, you have the ventricle, and you have the atrioventricular valves, which are preventing the backflow of the blood from the ventricle to the auricle. So when the blood comes from the auricle into the ventricle, it cannot go back. So it will be following this particular path into the truncus arteriosus, then it will be going into the aortic arches. Now here students, we have got two auricles and a single ventricle. We have got uh, some cordy tendini also. These are the cordy tendini which are present in the ventricle and they are helping uh, to ventricle, they are helping the ventricle to be open. So they are preventing the collapsing of the ventricle. Now students, the most important thing in the heart of the frog is this particular structure, which is called as the spiral valve. So in the BSEs also, you have gone through this particular uh, structure. The important thing is to keep the two streams separate. And this spiral valve is very, very important in keeping the two streams separate, as I have told you in the earlier slide. So God has given this heart a spiral valve, which can keep the two streams apart. And this is also called as a traffic manager. So as you have traffic managers on the road, this is the traffic manager for the blood, which is flowing through the truncus arteriosus and it is leaving into the aorta into different arteries. So here you can very well see, if you uh, go for this path, we have got three types of arteries. <clears throat> Number one, these are the carotids. Now carotid artery, it is going to the head part. They are taking the blood to the brain and the blood is coming back through the jugglers. So juggler is a vein, carotid is an artery. So you should be very clear about this particular thing. So first are the carotid arteries which are taking the blood to the brain. Second are the systemic arteries. Systemic, systemic refers to <clears throat> the systems, the viscera, the body organs. So from here, the blood will be going into the body organs. Third is the palmocutaneous arch or the palmocutaneous artery. So palmo, palmo refers to pulmonary and pulmonary are the lungs. What is cutaneous? Cutaneous refers to the skin. So from the palmocutaneous arch, the blood will be going into the lungs and the skin. So these are the four seats of the blood. First going to the head, second to the body parts, third to the lungs and the skin. So uh, you should remember these three kind of arches in the case of frog and you should remember the second thing that we have got a spiral valve in the frog's heart. So we'll be taking up the mechanism that how the blood flows through this particular heart and how the streams of the blood, they are kept separate. Now students, if I go further, uh, I am just giving you some of the characteristics of the amphibian hearts. Now, if you take the very first thing, we have got a double kind of circulation in the amphibians. As we have got two auricles and a single ventricle, so they are taking up two streams of blood and two streams are kept separate to some extent. So that is a kind of double circulation. Now, if I go further, this is a very, very important point. The sinus venosus, it takes the position near to the right auricle. We have seen this condition in the Dipnonians also. In the case of fishes, the sinus venosus was having the connection with the right auricle. There was no connection with the left auricle. So that means the sinus venosus 
it will be giving the blood to the right auricle only and right auricle will be having the deoxygenated blood so if you take our uh, condition also in case of humans we have the deoxygenated blood on the right side of the heart and on the left side we have the oxygenated blood from the lungs so same is the case in the amphibians same was the case in the fishes in the dipnonians so the sinus venosis has got a connection with the right auricle only now if we go for the next point this is that the sinus venosis it opens into the right auricle only so there is no connection with the left auricle <clears throat> now students if the sinus venosis has got a no connection with the right auricle that means the oxygenated blood it will go to the left auricle so the oxygenated blood which is coming from the lungs because amphibians they have got lungs the oxygenated blood from this seat of oxygenation it comes to the left auricle and then goes to the ventricle if i go if i go further now <clears throat> this is a particular case that you should follow very efficiently now the second case is now we had done about the left auricle now what about the right auricle the partially oxygenated blood now why it is written as partially so i have uh, taken a violet color for this i'm not taking a blue color for this because blue refers to the deoxygenated blood but this is partially oxygenated now why it is partially oxygenated because it is a combination of two types of blood streams the first stream is coming from the body this is a deoxygenated blood from the body plus oxygenated blood from the skin and the mouth lining so i have told you in the earlier segments of this lecture that along with the lungs you have got a mechanism of the skin and the buccopharyngeal cavity to oxygenate the blood so oxygenated blood from the skin and deoxygenated from the body they are coming together and they are making this partially oxygenated blood and this blood will go to the right auricle and then it will go to the ventricle so students as we have seen that sinus venosis has got relation with the right auricle so this partially oxygenated blood it will go first of all to the sinus venosis then it will go to the right auricle then to the ventricle so i think you are clear about the two streams first stream is of oxygenated blood is coming from lungs going to the left auricle second is of partially oxygenated blood to the right auricle then to the ventricle now both these streams they are going for the ventricle so that means a kind of mixing of the blood if we go further the ventricle has several a number of muscular ridges the infoldings and the outfoldings inside uh, its wall towards the inside they are present and they are keeping these two streams separate so this is one of the mechanism to keep the stream separate but there is another mechanism also so i'll be taking that particular mechanism in the coming slides now after this i am just giving you the concept that how the blood flows through this particular heart and how the two streams are kept separate now here we write as the ventricle it has two streams and they are uh, kept separate but there can be some some mixing to some extent 5 to 10% there can be uh, a mixing of the blood but that is again uh, you can say kept separate by this particular method 
Now, if I start with this particular thing, first of all, you have the conus arteriosus that has got the striated fibers. <clears throat> now, this part is the conus arteriosus or you can write it as the truncus arteriosus in case of the frogs. Now, if I go to the second point, this conus arteriosus or the truncus arteriosus, it has got two regions. Number one, it is called as the pilangium. So this is the first part of the truncus arteriosus or the conus arteriosus. So this is the lower part of the, uh, you can say the truncus and this is called as the pilangium. So this is the part which is next to the ventricle. So when the blood will flow into this part, this is the very first part which is receiving the blood of the ventricle. Now the second part of the conus is the synangium. So this is the second part or the upper part of the conus. And this part is more muscular as compared to the pilangium <clears throat> because the blood has to leave into the aortic arches through synangium. So that's why it is more muscular than the Phalangium. Now there are some valves in the conus arteriosus. As we have seen in the fishes, we have got these valves in the elasmobranchs. We have taken the case of teleost. We have a single set in teleost. In frogs also, we have got these valves in the conus arteriosus to check the backflow and to check the pressure when uh, the blood is going through these conus arteriosus valves. Now, these are some important valves. There are two sets of the valves present in the case of frog. Now, if we go for these two sets, the first set is at the base of the pilangium. So, this is the pilangium and this is the base and this is the valve. This infolding, this is the valve which is present at the base of the phalangium. So this is the first set. Now if we go for the second set, it is present at the junction of the phalangium and the synangium. So where you have the yellow arrow demarcating. So this is the part which is the, you can say, junction of the P and S. So here we have the second set of the valve. And out of these two valves, the second set, this valve, is modified into the spiral valve. Now this is the most important valve that is present in the frog. So we got two sets. The second set which is present at the junction of the P and S, it is being modified into the spiral valve. And that is making the spiral valve in the frogs. Now students, if we go further, this spiral valve, it is keeping the two streams separate when it leaves the heart. When the stream, it will leave the heart, it will be kept separate. Now how it is performing its function, I'll be taking up in this slide. Now students, this is the most important slide in amphibians. And if you follow this slide, you can uh, go for a very particular good answer in the examinations. Now, if we go for the circulation, first of all, the right auricle, it has got partially oxygenated blood as we have seen in the previous section. So it has the mixed blood and the left auricle has the oxygenated blood. So here we have seen, we can see that right auricle has got the deoxygenated blood or it is the partially oxygenated blood which has come from the body and the buccopharyngeal lining of the skin. And the left auricle has got the oxygenated blood from the lungs. Now students, the right auricle, it contracts slightly first, most important phenomenon. Now this is the most important thing in keeping the two separate streams. Now, if one auricle is contracting first, that means both the bloods 
from the auricles, they are not going into the ventricle simultaneously. So first of all, what we have, if the right auricle contracts first, its blood will be going into the ventricle. So here you can very well see the mixed blood enters the ventricle first. So there is no oxygenated blood coming to the ventricle. So that is a good thing and that is preventing the mixing of the blood. After this, what happens? Now this is a very important uh, line. So you should be concentrating on this particular line. So now we have this partially oxygenated blood in the ventricle or I have written here as MB. MB refers to the mixed blood. Now it is in the ventricle. It flows over the spiral valve. It is going into the truncus arteriosus. It goes on to the left side of the pilangium. So here it is going towards the left side and it goes into the pulmocutaneous arteries for oxygenation. So students, if you follow the route, so it will be going through the left part of the pilangium and spiral valve is now towards the right side. This is the important thing. Now spiral valve, it is on the right side it is towards the right auricle. The blood goes through the left side into the pulmocutaneous arch. Only the pulmocutaneous, not into carotid, not into systemic, but it is going into pulmocutaneous arch. Now, why is it going to pulmocutaneous? Because it is deoxygenated, it is partially oxygenated, it has to go to lungs, it has to go to pulmo, it has to go to cutaneous the skin for oxygenation. So that's why this kind of blood is flowing through the left side into the pulmocutaneous arch. Now students, what happens next? The wall of the pilangium is pressed on the spiral valve. So what happens next is that now there can be, there will be a vice versa kind of condition. So what will happen that if we go further, now the oxygenated blood comes into the ventricle. Now this is the second part of the, you can say, heart cycle, the flow of the cycle. Now the red blood, oxygenated blood from the left auricle, it comes to the ventricle. It flows over the spiral valve. Now it is from the right side of the pilangium and it enters into the systemic and the carotid arteries. Now, if you see the path, it is through the right side of the pilangium into the carotid and systemic arches. So this is the mechanism by which both the streams, they are kept separate and both the streams, they are taken into their respective arches. So as it is oxygenated blood, it will be flowing through the right side of the spiral valve and it will go to the head from the carotid to the body through the systemic arch. So students, I think you are very much clear about the circulation in case of frogs and you are very much clear about the function of the spiral valve, how the two streams are kept separate, what is the function of the spiral valve. That's why spiral valve is called as the traffic manager because when it is on the right side, the blood flows from the left side. When it is on the left side, the blood flows from the right side. And this is the basis of the circulation in amphibians. Now students, we have an example of the nectaris. Now it has got external gills as you can very well see in the diagram. It has got external gills, it is an amphibian and uh, from here the blood it is going to first of all the gills. These are the external gills. Now here it is oxygenated. 
so oxygenated blood from the gills it is uh, coming from the gills and the lungs through the pulmonary arteries so we got two seats of oxygenation first are the gills and next are the lungs now what happens now is it a better way of oxygenation mechanism that first the blood it will enter the gills then it will enter the lungs so that is a kind of, a kind of like a double kind of oxygenation as we have seen in the dipnonians so is it a better oxygenation mechanism in this particular animal answer is no now why is it no because in this particular case the lungs they function to a very less extent very less extent so actually the gills the external gills which are present in nacturus they are the main seat of oxygenation now here the lung is not functioning to a very well manner and it is only and only helping in the emergency conditions so there can be a double kind of oxygenation but in case of amphibians we have the gills as the primary oxygenation mechanism in case of nacturus only and here the lungs are used only in the emergency conditions now students there are some variations i'll be very quick about these variations <clears throat> so first of all the interatrial septum may be incomplete so this is a septum which is present in the both the atria the left and the right atria so we can have this septum as incomplete in some of the amphibians so we have the example of the lungless salamanders there can be some other variations also that sinus venosus may open both into right and left atria so as we have seen in the frog the sinus venosus was only uh, uh, having a connection with the right atrium so there is no connection with the left one but in some amphibians there can be a connection with the left atrium so that is a kind of disadvantage i think so there may be that may be a transition point in the uh, evolution of the heart now next variation may be that the left auricle which is having the oxygenated blood it may be reduced in size so in some of the animals it may be reduced in size and uh, fourth the spiral valve may be rudimentary in some of the cases so there may be some other mechanisms or the rugal like structures which are present in the wall of the ventricle that may be used by, uh, for the for keeping the two streams separate so in those cases the spiral valve may be rudimentary so students those were some of the variations and after that now we have to go for the coronary circulation now if we go for the coronary circulation in frogs or amphibians so a special coronary circulation is absent in many of the amphibians as the heart is needing some blood for its own functioning for its own working so that is called as the coronary circulation and in case of amphibians we don't have a special coronary circulation uh, in most of the amphibians but the main seat of making the coronary circulation is from the carotid arteries now these are the arteries which are having the freshest blood in case of the amphibians so we got two arches the carotids which are leading to the head part the second are the systemic which are going to the body part so here the coronary circulation it has been developed from the carotid arteries because they are having the oxygenated blood which is going to the head as the freshest blood it it is given always to the brain so we will have the oxygenated blood in the carotid arteries so from these arteries a branch is formed and this branch 
it is breaking up into many arteries, many fine tubules or vessels which are making a network. And from this particular network, we have the coronary arteries developed. Now these coronary arteries, they rejoin in the heart and they are making two veins. And the heart, it will use this oxygen from the coronary arteries. It will be deoxygenated. Now these two veins are number one. It is the vena bulbi anterior. So this is present in the heart. It is taking back the blood. And second vein is the vena bulbi posterior. So these two veins, they are taking back the blood to the, you can say the main circulation towards the uh, right side of the heart or to the sinus venosus. So students, that was the case of coronary circulation in case of amphibians. So with this, we end with the amphibians, the heart in the amphibians. We had seen that uh, this is a typical three-chambered heart. There is a full septum which is present inside the auricles. So there is no mixing in the auricles, but there can be some chance of mixing in the ventricle. But that mixing is uh, prevented with the help of the spiral valve. And the most important thing is that one auricle is uh, contracting slightly first. And that is the that is the mechanism of keeping the two streams separate. So students with this we finish with the amphibians and in the coming lecture we will be talking about the reptiles, about the modification of the heart in reptiles and uh, what are the modifications present in these types of hearts which are over due from the amphibians, what are the efficiencies of those hearts and what are the types of the coronary circulations which are present in the reptiles that will be taken up in the later section of the lecture. Thanks for now.